have Mike Behe, who is Professor of Biochemistry at Lehigh University. He's not wearing a flannel shirt this evening, so, <laughs> so it took me a while to recognize him there. Um, Bill Dembski was not able to make it in some of the early advertising we had him on the program, but uh, pinch hitting for him is Steve Meyer, who's director of the Center for Science and Culture, Division of the, of the Discovery Institute. Paul Nelson, then at the far end, he's an adjunct professor with me here, actually, in the Science and Religion program. And that's no reason for you guys to go easy on him, okay? <laughs> so, um, and then also Guillermo Gonzalez, who is the author of The Privileged Planet and is an assistant research professor of astronomy at Iowa State University. So, and last but not least, Jonathan Wells, author of Icons of Evolution, is here. From the critics' side, we have Anthony Flew, British philosopher. He's author of God and Philosophy. He flew all the way across the English, beyond the English Channel, across the <laughs> pond, um, in order to be here. Last night, we gave him a award, a Johnson Award for Liberty and Truth. So, uh, since he was here anyhow, he was uh, quite interested in being involved with the panel on this this evening. Then we have Larry Herber. The other end of the table there, he's a geologist from Cal Poly Pomona. He's retired, he says, but I have a feeling he still keeps very busy. Jim Hoffman is chair of the Liberal Studies Department, Cal State Fullerton. Dr. Charlotte Laws is a columnist and author. I think you can tell who she is. <laughs> <laughs> Keith Morrison is here from Dateline NBC as well. Then Craig Nelson, also from Cal State Fullerton lecturer in the Liberal Studies and Comparative Religion Department, and Bruce Weber, biochemist, is here as well. So these are our two panels. The basic format for this evening is that of a press conference, where these people to my left will be the questioners, the inquirers, and people to the right will be responding to their questions. Uh, but with any press conference, there's usually some brief introduction given. That's what Steve Meyer will do here in a moment. And the goal of Steve's introduction is to give you as the audience some sense of what is intelligent design and so on. Um, the critics have no obligation to respond to that. They have their own questions. Um, if they do respond to it, that's fine. And I am here as a moderator. My goal is to get out of the way. <laughs> okay, so which is what I will hopefully do. So, without any further ado, let's have Steve come up. I've been asked, as John said, to give an opening statement about uh, the theory of intelligent design to explain what it is. Um, if you've seen anything in the media, you might have uh, heard that intelligent design is science masquerading as religion. Uh, you might have heard that uh, some of us don't dress very well. We're creationists in cheap tuxedos. Uh, 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 but I want to give a different uh, perspective on that and tell you what we think it is. Uh, and perhaps the best way to explain what the theory of intelligent design is is to contrast it with uh, the, uh, the, the key claim on the other side of the argument from the neo-Darwinians. Uh, Richard Dawkins, one of the leading spokesmen for Darwinism in the world, has said that biology is the study of complicated things that have, give the appearance of having been designed for a purpose. Um, quick pop quiz, what's the key, the key word in that uh, appearance, okay, in that, in that quotation? Dawkins, uh, like many uh, Darwinists, says that, that uh, acknowledges that biological systems look designed but he says that, that appearance of design is illusory because there's a purely undirected process, namely natural selection acting on random mutations of various kinds that can produce that appearance without there being any actual guidance or intelligence behind it. Um, and that is the proposition that the theory of intelligent design is challenging. We're not necessarily challenging the idea of evolution per se. Certainly we're not challenging the idea of evolution meaning change over time nor are we necessarily challenging the idea of evolution as common ancestry. But we are challenging this specifically Darwinian or neo-Darwinian idea that life appears designed, but is not really designed, again, because there is this powerful undirected process that produced that appearance. So um, 
uh, Darwinism and neo-Darwinism have insisted that the appearance of design in living organisms is illusory. Uh, by contrast, we hold that there are certain features of living systems that can be best explained by the activity of a, uh, a designing intelligence rather than an undirected natural process, such as natural selection and random mutation. For us, living systems look designed because they really were designed. Now, maybe a simpler way to say that is that there are certain indicators or pointers or evidences that point to a prior intelligent cause, and you can see those in the scientific evidence. So the issue that intelligent design is raising is simply this. Is design real or is it illusory? We hold that it's real. Our Darwinian colleagues, as opposed to generic evolutionists, hold the opposite. Now, why do we say this? Why do we say that design is real, not illusory? Well, we say it because there are some discoveries in modern science and biology, and also we'll hear from Guillermo Gonzalez in the physical sciences as well, but I'm going to speak mostly in this short opener about the biology. There's some discoveries that Darwin didn't know about. In particular, inside biological cells, which in the 19th century were thought to be simple homogeneous globules of plasm, to quote T.H. Huxley, one of Darwin's contemporaries, uh, scientists have discovered nanotechnology, little tiny miniature machines, circuits, and information processing systems. Uh, the image behind me is of a machine called an APT synthase, which is essentially an energy-driven uh, turbine. It runs on the same principles as a dam, but the, the, uh, this, the energy that is produced by this turbine is driven by a flow of ions. There's a sophisticated mechanical coupling device that's responsible for building ATP, the battery pack of the cell. It's a very sophisticated little machine. Uh, there are also circuits in cells. Michael Behe has made a number of these famous in his book, Darwin's Black Box. And of course, he's also made famous other machines like this bacterial flagellar motor, a true rotary engine with rotors and stators and O-rings and drive shafts and bushings and bearings and a whip-like propeller. Uh, Behe has defined systems like this as irreducibly complex, by which he means systems that have a number of well-matched parts that are functionally integrated such that the loss of any particular part in this system causes the whole to lose function. Uh, he has argued that natural selection and random mutation do not produce systems like this, and further argued that these systems provide evidence of design. Um, there is also another uh, design argument in biology, and this is the argument from digital information, or what we sometimes refer to as specified complexity. It turns out that in the cell, like in a computer program, the, 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 the show is run by information. I asked, used to ask my students, if you want to get your computer to perform a new function, what do you have to give it? And uh, they would know, almost better than uh, anyone over 40, uh, you have to give it new code. And the same thing turns out to be true in life. If you want to build a new living organism from a pre-existing form, or if you want to build life in the first place, you have to provide information. Take this flagellar motor I, I put up a minute ago. It's made of protein parts. The proteins are in turn made of amino acids. The amino acids only fold and form functional parts if they are arranged in the precise sequence. And that sequence is in turn uh, determined and governed and constructed by the information that's stored in the molecule DNA, which literally is a form of digital code. It contains a digital code with the assembly instructions for building those critical proteins. So a, cr a critical question in the history of life, both at the point of the origin of the first life and at the point of certain uh, significant events such as the Cambrian explosion, uh, where you find fundamentally new forms arising, is where did the new information come from that is necessary to build life and to build those new forms? Uh, we have argued that that information is best explained by reference to a prior intelligent cause. Uh, and part of our reason for doing so is the nature of the information itself. Richard Dawkins has pointed out that the information in biology is, is like the information in software code. It's a machine code, he says. Bill Gates has said the same, that DNA is like a computer program, but far more advanced than any we've ever created. We know from experience that computer programs are built by programmers. We know more generally that information 
always arises from conscious activity, as one early molecular, uh, information scientist who applied information science to molecular biology pointed out. The creation of new information is habitually associated with conscious activity. Now, this is a very significant <clears throat> observation because one of the key rules in scientific reasoning about the past in the historical sciences is that we should uh, look for presently acting causes, that our knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world in the present should guide our inferences about the past. This is the famous dictum, the uniformitarian dictum of Charles Lyell, one of Darwin's mentors. And his idea was that when we're trying to explain the past, we should not invent causes, exotic causes, the effects of which we've never seen, but instead we should explain the past by reference to causes that we see presently in operation. And when I was studying Lyell and Darwin and the methods of the historical sciences during my graduate work in England, I asked myself the question, what is the presently acting cause of digital information? The pre and I submit that it is intelligence. We know that from re uniform and repeated experience, the basis of all knowledge. And in a similar way, we can ask the question about irreducibly complex systems. We know from experience when we find such systems, whether they're integrated circuit boards or internal combustion engines, invariably an intelligence played a role. So the argument from intellig or for intelligent design is not based on ignorance or just a critique of what naturalistic models like neo-Darwinism cannot do, but instead it's based on our positive knowledge of the cause and effect structure of the world. So contrary to what you might have heard in the media, that the idea of the intelligent design is the idea that life is so complex it must have been produced by a, a, a supernatural designer, intelligent design is not arguing from ignorance, it's arguing from our positive knowledge. It's not just a punt because we can't imagine how, how these systems arose, rather it's based on our knowledge of what it always takes to build systems that have information rich um, uh, uh, code or information processing systems or irreducibly complex systems. So the basis of intelligent design is not religion, as is often asserted, but rather it's the discovery of molecular machines and circuits and cells the discovery of digital information and an inform information processing system in the cell, and in physics, the discovery of the fine-tuning of the laws of, and constants of physics, which I haven't had a chance to talk about. And finally, it's based on inferences from these evidences that are based on standard modes of scientific reasoning in which our knowledge of cause and effect guides our reconstructions of the past. So we submit intelligent design is a fully scientific theory, and we'll leave it to our critics to uh, bring it on. I've been asked to lead off this evening because I'm a ringer. Uh, you heard the phrase irreducibly complex. That's what all of that sounded like to me. He lost me in the first sentence. <laughs> um, uh, and there are others here on the stage who uh, will have questions, I'm sure, about uh, the, the content and the substance of these uh, uh, theories. And I, I, w I understand that there is a, a, a considerable amount of debate within the uh, scientific and quasi-scientific community about these issues. I, I, I have heard repeatedly, because I, I do listen to talk radio as well as most people in this country from time to time, that there is also a view that the media has a view. Um, I suspect I probably have to remind you that the media isn't a thing. It's, a, it's several hundreds of thousands of people who all have quite different views about things. Um, and I have, uh, am approaching this from ignorance, as I said earlier, but also simply uh, from a lifelong interest in um, questions uh, of religion and how they affect uh, uh, culture, how they affect politics, uh, how various different um, groups within religions relate to one another, and so on and so on. Uh, this is a particularly interesting issue, I think, in this country today because there is such a divide between uh, those who are on one side of the political spectrum and tend to, to, to share certain religious points of view and those who are on the other side of the political spectrum which share other religious points of view. And I think, you know, when, when you hear something about how the media has commented on intelligent design, that tends to be one of those kind of that tends to be one of those issues on which people jump from one side to the other and therefore it's seen as uh, something that we jump on. Uh, but it is used and that is why 
I have some questions this evening, just to see where those who have posited the theories of intelligent design actually stand on questions of religion. Uh, or if nowhere, then I think we, we need to know nor, nowhere. Um, I address this question to really anybody on the panel, and I'm sure somebody's uh, happy to explain to me. Um, what kind of intelligent being are you proposing, or are you proposing any specific kind of intelligent being? First of all, Keith, I, we welcome your interest in this. Uh, I've dealt with a number of your colleagues over the last mm -hmm. uh, 18 months or so as this has become hugely uh, uh, interesting to the, to the mainstream press. Uh, we find that our scientific arguments and the scientific evidence, which is the basis of our claims and arguments, it's it just simply not reported. And that w I've been on a number of these uh, right. uh, mainstream talking head programs, and typically the format goes something yeah. like this. You have a three-minute uh, uh, backgrounder filed by a reporter that uh, conflates the theory of intelligent design with young earth creationism, mm -hmm. uh, usually has someone speaking who is not part of the intelligent design research community, but someone mm -hmm. at a school board who... Uh, uh, says something embarrassingly uh, uh, <laughs> ill-considered, and then uh, then uh, uh, the the host will come on and say something uh, and introduce our opposite number in the debate with full credentials, and then uh, uh, then they'll turn to me and say, "So, Mr. Meyer, uh, what do you think of all this?" And yeah. and so we find that it's there does seem to be in in the media a perception that. Uh, uh, this is something that need not be taken seriously. And, well, I, and I'm glad to know that, that you're not the only one who feels abused by the media. I do myself. <laughs> but, in fact, I bet I've been abused more often than you. Uh, anyway. By, it's, since uh, you were here. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Anyway, you asked Feel free. Yeah, you asked a different question. Uh, the, the, there's a difference between the theory of intelligent design and the particular religious beliefs that those who hold it or don't hold it might happen to have. Uh -huh. And the, th the theory is, is, as I said, uh, a, a theory which is, is posing a challenge to the standard Darwinian view of evolution, which says that design is not real but apparent. Right. And the word intelligent design was uh, carefully thought out as a way of making clear what it is we're challenging, what we're not. There are methods of detecting intelligence that have come out through the, the information sciences. It's possible to determine when an effect is the product of agency or intention as opposed to undirected natural processes. As a simple example, take the Rosetta Stone. There's inscriptions on the Rosetta Stone that are clearly not the result of uh, uh, wind and erosion, but were the product of, a, of an intentional agent, a scribe. Sure. And there are ways of analyzing symbol strings in cryptography and so forth to determine when you're dealing with something that's the product of law or chance as opposed to something that's the product of intelligence. The and fact so that, that I didn't understand what you just said, and <laughs> I bet you maybe a tenth of the audience had some kind of an idea, is why, <laughs> is why the media will tend to uh, not explain it very accurately. I just thought I, I'm interjecting to say well, only that. Let's get to even, maybe try another example. Um, we're, we're talking about the digital code in cells. It's information. Right. Um, we think from the science you can tell that there is such information and from what we know about the, what causes information in our experience that mm -hmm. there therefore must have been an intelligence. We cannot tell from those symbol strings in the DNA who the author of that information is. It's like having a computer right. program or a section of literary text where the, where the text is not signed. So fr from the science we think we can tell that there was an intelligence but we don't claim to know from the science the identity or nature of the uh, of, of the intelligent agent responsible. So we've been we've been portrayed as sneaky and uh, uh, underhanded because we're not willing to come out and say we think it's God. In fact, some of us, for other reasons beyond the the, the biological evidence, mm -hmm. uh, think that the designer likely was God. But we're trying to be careful, not sneaky, when we say we can tell that sure. there was an intelligence, but we can't tell from the science the nature and identity of same. I understand that, and 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 I'm. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to accept blame on, on behalf of the media for inadequate explanations, but also for, uh, for something curious which has happened. We're happy to accept blame for using too many big words. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the difficulties we have, we have all encountered, I think, is that 
uh, in, in our understanding of, of the message that you are uh, giving us is that it is the way it's being used. And in our culture at the moment, it's being, uh, your, your views are being opposed by much, the majority of the scientific community and, in, and, and, and much of the progressive side of the Christian community, this being a largely Christian country, and embraced by the conservative spectrum of the uh, uh, Christian community, embraced most enthusiastically by those who take the Bible quite literally. Um, I, in the past week, have been listening to sermons being <coughs> preached in various parts of the country. I love listening to sermons of all kinds, and I find, generally speaking, that preachers are marvelous people to spend time with. Um, and intelligent design was used in the arguments of all the preachers in all the conservative churches I have attended, actually, in the last several years. And intelligent design is a theory which doesn't get much credence at all in any of the progressive churches I have attended in the last several years. Although it's clear to me that most of the people in these progressive churches also happen to believe in God since 98 or 9 percent of the Christians in the country do believe in God. Um, <laughs> but, that, but, but that in other words, <laughs> that belief doesn't make them want to support intelligent design whether they understand it or not. It makes them want to oppose it. The belief on the, on the conservative side makes them want to embrace it. Are you comfortable with that political result of this argument? Well, maybe I can say something. Um, no, sure, we're not. Uh, I, I think people don't, most people don't understand intelligent design and try to fit it into pre-existing categories. Certainly that's true in the scientific community. Most people have, uh, have a skewed view of intelligent design there and many people throughout the country do too. And I think that the reason that it's accepted in one, uh, one segment of society versus another has a lot less to do with what exactly the theory of intelligent design says than, uh, than stereotypes that already exist uh, in the country. Uh, you know, uh, let me give you a little analogy from, from you know, uh, a, a while back, about 60, 70 years ago. When the Big Bang Theory was first proposed, uh, a lot of scientists hated it because it seemed to suggest a religious event, creation, you know, what could the Big Bang be except, you know, the beginning of the universe. Uh, but what we're trying to get across, and not as successfully as we'd like, is that we want to focus on the evidence because uh, in Steve's intro, Things have really changed in the past couple decades in science. There are things at the bottom of life nobody expected. There are things, features of the universe beyond the Big Bang nobody expected. And they all are pointing generally in the same way. That is, the, this universe seems to be balanced on a, on a knife edge to permit life to exist. And the basis of life that we've discovered in the past few decades in the cell is incredibly sophisticated technology. Uh, that's the message we want to get across, but unfortunately it kind of has to be presented in a background which, which already has some stereotypes that uh, kind of confuse issues. It's, tend to, it's often used to back up suggestions that Genesis is actually accurate history. Are you comfortable with that? Could you give me an example? Oh, well, uh, several of the sermons, as I say, that I've heard in the last uh, few weeks. I I'm not suggesting that they're quoting you accurately or that the media is quoting you accurately, but you have fallen into those two quite distinct baskets within the Christian community. And it's fascinating, is all. Um, uh, how, how, would you, how would you like to I think what Mike has said is correct the misapprehension? Yeah, very good. That, 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 that we need some more baskets. There's not enough categories to hold you know, this new idea. But uh, it I might be helpful just to make a, a careful distinction between intelligent design and creationism, for, just for the record. Uh, intelligent des we, we think there are two key differences between intelligent design and creationism. The first is our theory is not a theory about the book of Genesis, the days of creation, or the length of time that the earth has existed. It's a theory about the origin of the complexity and information-bearing properties of life and the fine-tuning of the universe. Uh, secondly, 
uh, the method of inquiry is different, whereas creationism takes as a, its starting point a scriptural text and makes deductions or inferences from that. We're making inferences from biological data rather than deductions from a religious authority. So uh, our theory may have uh, implications that are friendly to a broadly theistic world view, but the theory is based on scientific evidence and it is not a, a theory about the book of Genesis. I think as moderator, we could go all evening on just no, Keith's no, good points go here, so <laughs> let me shift over to Jim Hoffman for his set of questions. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Jim Hoffman. I'm here with two colleagues. We're the, the Fullerton team. This, <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, the Titans, right, exactly. Yeah. Bruce Weber, who is a biochemist, and Craig Nelson, who teaches mainly comparative religion. Uh, we all three of us teach courses on evolution and creation, and uh, we include discussions of intelligent design in our courses. We completely mutilate the theory. We teach our students a warped and twisted version of it so that they yeah. think, just kidding. <laughs> 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 uh, no, we're very faithful to the, to the literature, and we have them read uh, extensively by these authors right yeah. here. Um, about a decade ago, actually this isn't our first visit to Biola, but it's the first time anyone's listened to anything we have to say. Um, <laughs> um, about 10 years ago, we were here for the uh, Just Creation Conference, which was one of the sort of seminal events that got the intelligent design movement started. Several of the people here uh, participated in that event. And uh, one thing we're asking ourselves, just as I, I'm going, just giving a brief little uh, introduction here, then we'll get to the questions. Uh, one thing our, we are asking ourselves is why, why is this event happening here at Biola? Uh, not that Biola is not an appropriate place for uh, events, but if intelligent design is primarily a religious position, then certainly this would be an appropriate venue. Similar discussions take place on uh, uh, Catholic colleges, for example, especially when theistic evolution is discussed. On the other hand, if we're here to discuss the scientific merits of intelligent design, well, Shouldn't a press conference be, be held in a scientific venue at a scientific conference? Now, that's what you would think. Um, if you look back at the history of science, revolutionary ideas have repeatedly overcome entrenched scientific attitudes through scientific debate carried out by well-informed specialists in the relevant fields. Indeed, the idea of common descent and the Big Bang theory of cosmology gained uh, consensus within the scientific community in exactly that way. Since then, of course, science has become ever more specialized, and if intelligent design is a scientifically fruitful theory, then it seems to us that discussions of intelligent design should be taking place at relevant scientific meetings and in scientific journals. Instead, we're here at Biola, indeed we're going to have a good time talking about all this, but our conversation will have virtually no impact on the scientific community. Now, why is that? Uh, because they're closed-minded? Well, perhaps, but mainly because if scientific an advance in scientific knowledge is to be achieved, then that insight has to be presented and argued at relevant scientific venues. Those arguments have to be followed up with peer-reviewed publications in the major journals like Nature, Science, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, for example. Uh, until those kind of publications are produced, then uh, you could say that intelligent design is an interesting idea, it's something to be discussed by philosophers, theologians, but until scientists become enough interested in it uh, to take it seriously and until publications start appearing in scientific journals, then it's not clear that intelligent design has anything scientifically interesting to offer. So what we'd like to do first is have Bruce talk about some relevant examples out of many that could be chosen about how actual scientific research is being done on complex molecular systems, and then ask for some responses from the panel. May I have the first slide, please? Uh, it's been a decade, as Jim mentioned, since the Mere Creation Conference that we attended. And in that time, there has been uh, quite a bit of progress addressing questions of the emergence of complex structures. Uh, the first slide shows <laughs> essentially uh, two models of explanation of trying to deal with the sort of thing that Michael Behe's talked about, an irreducibly complex system. You have a number of molecules 
here, protein molecules, that come together in a complex way to produce something that's functional. And the argument is, how can you get uh, natural selection for this when these have no function separate from their role in the structure here? Now, an alternative uh, that is uh, a Darwinian uh, explanation is that you had proteins that initially had a different function, either the function was no longer needed, or by well-documented genetic mechanisms, extra copies of genes are uh, produced and through mutation, new sequences arise such that new functions can emerge and uh, selection can act on those and ultimately uh, as they start to uh, form a new function, the, the, these functions may continue through gene duplication, you get the function here. This process is called exaptation. So one of the challenges for Darwinism is can people working in the modern evolutionary synthesis uh, produce, find evidence in nature of this sort of exaptation occurring? Next slide is the flagellum. And there's over 50 proteins, a very complex uh, piece of molecular machinery. And uh, however, uh, working on the uh, premise that there might well be exaptation occurring, people have been looking at the sequences of the genes for these different proteins and looking for uh, homologies with other functional uh, protein clusters in bacteria, uh, about 85% of the proteins have been identified. Uh, now, this doesn't prove that that's how it happened, but it's at least suggestive of the possibility of exaptation and allows for the possibility of guiding further research. It's possible, I'm not going to make a prediction, but I'll say it's possible uh, when we get together 10 years from now here that we might have to concede that this has a story, you know, can be explained by a series of, ex of uh, exaptations and is therefore not irreducibly complex. Uh, on next slide, but also we, there's more that we can do these days. Now this is an article in the uh, uh, April 7th issue of Science. I'm not going to make the uh, assertion that this somehow disproves irreducible complexity. What's rather, I think, is interesting about this particular experiment is that it involved uh, deducing an ancestral sequence from comparative studies, making that gene, then making the protein, looking at its properties, and essentially uh, working out mutational pathways and gives, uh, uh, a, in the test tube type experiment, showing how an exaptation might have occurred. I think that's what's interesting in the experiment. Uh, the next slide, uh, a few pages further on in that issue of science, uh, there's an enzyme, a beta lacamase in bacteria that if it has five mutations can produce a 100,000 fold uh, resistance to antibiotics. And they were able to, with the, having the gene and then uh, doing the tricks of biotechnology, to work out all the possible mutational pathways, the sequential steps. Not all of them are susceptible to uh, being a, a, a selected, but there, is, uh, there are several, of the 120 pathways, there are a few. They can actually quantitatively estimate how likely they are, and there's a green line here of the most likely pathway of mutation. Again, as we get information about the flagellum, we might be able to do these experiments and see is it possible or not that there would be a Darwinian pathway to get there. Uh, the next slide. Uh, this is from last week's Nature. Uh, it's another uh, type of uh, line of evidence in terms of retrotransposons and their functions in cells. And uh, as you probably can't see here, but the basic point is that they assert that this is one of a a number of examples in terms of these novel uh, jumping gene type uh, experiments that indicate that uh, there is exaptation occurring. Now, 
The question I'd like to put to the panel is this. Although research on Darwinian acceptations is still very much a work in progress, at least progress is being made. And in contrast, I'd like to know where the progress is in our understanding of such biochemical systems that has been gained from uh, I, the intelligent design theory, per se, during the past decade. Given this contrast, why would a scientist abandon the, the productive research program of the Darwinian modern evolutionary synthesis for one informed by intelligent design? C can I start with that one? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I kind of suspect it. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I would submit, um, kind of as a preliminary, that there has been no Darwinian pr progress on explaining molecular machinery, and that all of the stuff that has been alluded to and, and much, much more is actually just regular biochemistry which is being spun in a Darwinian fashion. Uh, let me start uh, with the bacterial flagellum and the type 3 secretory system. The uh, idea which has been popularized by uh, Ken Miller is that perhaps this type 3 secretory system, which is actually kind of just a little injection apparatus, uh, could have been a precursor to the bacterial flagellum, which is in fact a rotary motor. And to get across the problem with that, I'm going to start with kind of a cartoon example uh, that uh, I started with and, and Ken Miller picked up on. I, I started to illustrate the, uh, the idea of irreducible complexity, I used a mouse trap. And I think probably many <coughs> people in the audience are, 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 uh, are um, familiar with that. A mouse trap has a number of different parts, uh, and uh, all of the parts are necessary. And in a number of different, um, different uh, venues, Ken, Ken has uh, said, well, you can use the mouse trap for other things. You can use it for a clipboard. You can remove pieces and use it as a keychain. You can even use part of it as a, as a paperweight. Oh, <laughs> thanks very much for putting that up. I was going to surprise people with these pictures, though. <laughs> <laughs> and here's a real mouse trap. And it sounds pretty good when he says that. But when you see pictures of real clipboards and keychains and paperweights, somehow the idea is this would be used to make a keychain, which would be used to make a clipboard. This would somehow end up as a mouse trap. Uh, and and uh, I want to emphasize that it's real easy. There, there's kind of a, 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 a rhetorical dissymmetry or asymmetry in, in, this, in this debate in that Darwinists want you to think that making transitions is easy. So they'll kind of say, oh, well, that's no problem. Let's just start with a paperweight, and then we can go to a keychain. So it's not irreducible. M but I, I would suggest, oh, let me okay. finish I, this I, sentence. I, 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 then, just the only thing is that uh, going from a paperweight to a keychain is not the same as going from a gene uh, for one function to another. Maybe five mutations are sufficient. Yeah, well, this, was, this, wasn't my, uh, this wasn't my analogy. This was Ken Miller's analogy. Okay. <laughs> and I just want to suggest that here's the problem. Not only is this, I, I would consider this an intellectually unserious response to the problem of, of irreducible complexity. Another problem is that if you ask yourself, if you start with some structure that's being selected to be a paperweight, it's not going to be prepared at all to be a keychain a structure that's a keychain isn't going to be prepared at all for a clipboard. And if somebody says, I'm going to accept this and use it for a clipboard, well, you may as well say, I'm going to accept a paperweight. You haven't gone any of the way towards a clipboard. But Michael, what about the question I asked? OK, I, 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 I thought I was answering it. <laughs> now, let me, let me continue then. Uh, could we go uh, to? The, uh, skip the next two slides to the third. This is kind of a slide that's similar to the one that Professor Weber showed. There we go. Thank you very much. And here's the, the, uh, here's the um, idea. Suppose you have an irreducibly complex molecular machine made up of six different parts, uh, labeled A to F. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Suppose that they started out as individual precursors, each of which had their own, uh, their own function. Could you, next slide, please. 
Now suppose they got together somehow. Now you could have an irreducibly complex machine, the story goes, but each of the parts had their own, their own function. And I submit that even if all of these things are doing the exact same thing they would do in the irreducibly complex machine, you still can't get from these parts to here, even if they're doing the same thing. And why is that? Well, here is one, here's one uh, reason. Proteins are not little colored squares. <laughs> exactly. They are not little colored figures like Ken Miller showed on his slide. Why does the A go next to the B here, besides being in the alphabet there? Why doesn't it go down here? Why aren't these in a line instead of something like this? What makes a real protein stick to another real protein and another real protein stick to that? They stick to each other because they have very complex surfaces which are matched to each other. The chemical and physical properties have to be just so, like little magnets that are lined up. Uh, in order to allow them to bind. Could I have the next slide, please? This is the real problem that would face that scenario. You would have proteins, A, B, C, D, which did not have the right shapes in order to bind to each other. In order to form a molecular, uh, an irreducibly complex molecular machine, they would have to pre-adapt all of their shapes in order just to bind to each other. Michael, Michael? Yes. Again, uh, I would like you to address the issue. What I was talking about were not only hints from the comparative sequences, but the fact that we have the technology now to take those genes and you know, get putative ancestral sequences, mutate them, find out how the proteins might fit together, look at perhaps functional intermediates that are along that pathway that you put the X's on. And what do you tell the scientist who's pursuing that kind of program that will give them a better research program that they should abandon that approach for an ID approach? I don't think they should abandon it. I just say that they aren't doing a Darwinian approach. They're simply looking for, for different structures and then ascribing the results to, to Darwinian process. Well, I would assert that it's being guided by understanding of both uh, common descent and also selection of principles. No, so I, it, think it, I don't think so. Uh, let's take, for example, the science paper that, that came out that, that you spoke about, the, uh, the uh, Thornton paper from the laboratory of uh, Thornton at, uh, what, Oregon. Um, they took a protein, they made a protein uh, using information from current proteins, and this protein that they made was able to bind three different what are called steroid hormones three different kinds of steroid hormones, which one of the two proteins, the modern proteins, can do itself. Then they introduced a couple of mutations into it, as suggested by the sequence of, of, the pro, the, of another of the modern proteins. And they saw that the three hor steroid hormones bound to the mutated protein about a thousand fold less strongly than they did before. And as far as I could see, that was the result. They started with a protein that had an ability. They introduced a couple mutations. It decreased the ability. Now, in my mind, that says nothing at all about how one could get an irreducibly complex molecular machine like this yeah. or the flagellum uh, or, or any yeah. such and thing. And of course, my point my was it's not irreducibly complex, that issue. But the technology opens the way to do experiments to address the issue of these yeah, yeah. interfaces. Here's a critical, a critical, I mean, just briefly say so, Steve wants to say something. Here's a critical problem. At no point did they investigate whether any of these things conferred a selective advantage on an organism. You can make whatever you want to, but in nature, if Darwin's theory is correct, the pathway has to be give an advantage to the organism. Their intermediate uh, that they made uh, bound the hormones that the starting protein bound significantly less strongly. To my mind, I would be very suspicious that that was 
uh, a detriment that would be a detrimental. Well, it was a change in specificity of the uh, of the protein that occurred. Well, but clearly, you can't extrapolate though <laughs> to yeah, anything we'll significant when you're losing here. when you're using losing binding strength. And also, Ralph Silke, who's here, a biologist from uh, Wisconsin, and he's used the analogy to capture what was done. He said it's like you have a a, a lock, uh, a key that will open two locks, and you then you have. Uh, some random grinding on the on the, the tines and the key, and then you can open one lock at mm -hmm. the end. Uh, this is clearly not the kind of change that can be in extrapolated indefinitely to produce significant biological change. So a lot of these results that you're pointing to, uh, we, we, we welcome. We're delighted that people are taking Mike's work seriously enough that they're trying to refute it. That's the kind of thing that indicates the existence of a scientific debate. Right. But we don't think that the results have refuted Mike or provided a better explanation. I'd like to talk just briefly about the type 3 secretory system because there's a very clear, testable scientific um, implication of the two competing theories here. Mike's theory is that the system is irreducibly complex and that it indicates a prior intelligent design. The type 3, uh, or the, the co-option hypothesis, acceptation, as you call it, of Ken Miller, indicates that the type 3 secretory system and the genes that produced it were uh, an ancestral form, a precursor. There's clear to uh, two clearly different implications. Well, one says that the, the genes in the type 3 is older, older than the bacterial flagellum and the genes that produced it, and the other says just the opposite. The design hypothesis has the implication that the, the uh, bacterial flagellum and the genes that produced, 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 produced it are older. Um, that shows that there are empirical implications that are testable. First of all, these two competing hy hypotheses, Mike's as well as Miller's. Now, interestingly, the, the data that's coming in is showing that the type 3 is a devolutionary byproduct of the, the molecular machine. The genes for building the type 3 secret, uh, secretory system are, in, uh, in several different cases, uh, show the same thing, uh, that, is, that, the, that the information is derivative of an aboriginal genome. The genes are often carried on plasmids for building the type 3. They are often in islands of pathogenicity that show that they have been imported from outside the system into the aboriginal genome. And there, are, and there is one case where the, there are the genes for building the whole of the motor, but the genes that are expressed early uh, for building the, the type 3 are, are, the whole, are all that get expressed. And so in each, and, but the whole of the, the, the rest of the genome is there present, but an insertional mutation has prevented the rest of those genes from being, from being fully expressed. So, so uh, th there's a lot of evidence piling up that the, that the genes for building the type 3 are, uh, are, are, are younger and that the genes for building the, the bacterial flagellum are older, which confirms Mike's hypothesis over and against Miller's. And I, I would further submit that simply pointing to something that is conceivably an intermediate form does not meet the, the challenge that Mike has laid down. No, and I, I'm, I'm accepting that. Okay, because no. his challenge, to, to, to provide a fully Darwinian explanation for the origin of a complex molecular machine like the flagellar motor, you need not just to have a platform of function somewhere along the way from simple to complex. You have to have a series of functionally selectable intermediates. And we know such a series doesn't exist precisely because these systems are irreducibly complex in this, in the, well, in, in it the. It seems like you're assuming the answer. No, no. They're <laughs> irreducibly complex in the specific meaning that, uh, that uh, people doing knockout experiments know. That if you knock out a gene in that, that the 30 proteins that make up the flagellar motor, you know that you lose function. That is to say that the immediately precedent steps on the way from simple to complexity are non-functional. And so the challenge has not been met the, of, of, a, of a, a gradual account of the origin of those molecular machines. This hand waving and referring to paperweights and stuff is all kind of cute, but it's a word game rather than an actual scientific explanation. Yeah, but, but I would still assert that it is through this sort of informa uh, information about sequences, these can be resolved. But to what it, it is still being driven, not by, I can see, intelligent design. I don't see laboratories dedicated to that producing these kinds of data. Well, Steve, Bruce, Steve. we welcome that. I mean, th that's your research program. You, you're, <laughs> go for it. You know, Steve, Paul, we, we, Paul we welcome that. that. <laughs> Yeah, but we've got a different research program, you know? so you should keep at it and see if you can meet Mike's challenge, but just because people are working on it doesn't mean that we should stop doing what we're doing. May I, may I respond to a comment that Jim made originally, and I'd like my slide number 29, please. 
Good luck. Oh. <laughs> Slide 29. I want to recapitulate Jim's remark and then respond to it. He said, why are we having this debate at Biola in what he implied was a religious setting? Why isn't this debate going on in a scientific setting? Uh, and I'm, I'm waiting on my slide. While I'm waiting on it, I'll give you a, a story. In October last year, I was in Washington, D.C. Uh, to, to speak at uh, the American Enterprise Institute, and I went to the American Association for the Advancement of Science Building, which is the largest organization of scientists in the country, to hear a scientist from Caltech named Chris Adami. And the room was jammed, the auditorium was jammed, very much like this room is tonight. And Chris Adami was describing an experiment that he and Richard Lenski and some colleagues published in Nature, one of the very journals that Jim mentioned, next to Science, the most prestigious science journal in the world. This experiment, which I'm, I'm sorry, that's not slide 29. <laughs> could, you, could you give me slide 30, please? <laughs> Yes, thank you. This is the experiment he was describing, published in Nature, a major paper. And that night, Chris said, I want to tell you why I began this research project. And he flashed up a slide of the cover of Darwin's Black Box. He said, Mike Behe has made an argument about the nature of living things, namely that they have these irreducibly complex properties. This is a fascinating argument, and I want to respond to it as a scientist. So he and Lenski and his colleagues wrote a computer program to try to evolve, via Darwinian mechanisms, apparently irreducibly complex instruction sets. Now, the AAAS videotaped that speech. It was clear that that night, Chris Adami's research was to respond to the scientific case that Mike Behe was making in detail. The whole context of his research was to do that. And this paper, published in Nature, was to do that. Can you advance it one step? This is the opening sentence of the abstract. A long-standing challenge to evolutionary theory has been whether it can explain the origin of complex organismal features. Now, notice the verb here. It's a passive. Who is raising that long-standing challenge? Well, it wasn't Chris Adami. It was Mike Behe. It was the people on this panel. Now, here's why this is weird. There's a funny kind of asymmetry with respect to intelligent design in the scientific literature. It's perfectly possible to critique intelligent design and to publish papers like this in Nature. But Mike Behe would have a very hard time getting one of his own papers in, making a case for irreducible complexity in the same journal. Now, that, I think, is like playing a game of softball with two sets of rules, one for the home team, one for the visitors. The debate about intelligent design has been joined in the scientific literature. One of the papers that Bruce Weber put up from Science <clears throat> just a couple of weeks ago, Chris Adami wrote a commentary, a News and Views commentary about that paper. The title of that commentary was Reducible Complexity. And the whole argument of his commentary was, we now have evidence to answer Mike Behe's case about irreducible complexity irreducible complexity. So this is the other most prestigious journal in the world, making a case against irreducible complexity. So you can see that a debate has been joined in the scientific literature about intelligent design. It's already going on, but there's this funny set of rules. One set of rules for the home team, one set of rules for the visitors. I look forward to the day when Mike can make his case in the same journals the way his critics can. Thank you. <laughs> I'd like to basically uh, just add two cents to that as well, which is that uh, the, the critics who are making the claim that intelligent design is not legitimate because it hasn't been published in appropriate peer-reviewed journals are making first and foremost a procedural argument. This is not a substantive argument about the evidence or the explanations or the arguments that are being made for design, it's an argument about where the argument is taking place, as if you could tell the truth of an idea by where it's being discussed. Um, I, um, I had an experience of, of publishing a peer-reviewed article in a scientific journal, 
And while nothing terrible happened to me, the editor who allowed the article to go forward, Richard von Sternberg at the Smithsonian Institution, was deprived of his office, his keys, his access to samples. His religious and political affiliations were interrogated. He was uh, uh, the subject of a disinformation campaign by senior people in the Smithsonian. And all of this was, was uh, verified by an independent investigation by the Office of Special Counsel, an independent uh, government watchdog organization that investigated his complaint as to his uh, treatment not because he was an advocate of intelligent design, but simply because he allowed a paper advocating intelligent design to go through the, the standard peer review procedure. And I think this underscores the fact that the peer review process has become exceedingly conservative when topics of an ideologically sensitive nature come before peer review panels. And that means that we cannot determine the truth of an idea by whether or not it's peer reviewed. We have to look at the evidence itself. Uh, in fact, I think I'm, I'm very proud of my colleagues for what they have published since the Mirror Creation Conference in 1996. A number of our most important works have been published in peer-reviewed books, and, many, and re revolutionary ideas in science often begin in books. William Dembski's Design Inference was published in a peer-reviewed series in Cambr from Cambridge University Press. And uh, so both books and articles are coming out supporting intelligent design, but there are significant barriers, as Paul has alluded to, and I, and I think we all look forward to the day when we can have a much more open discussion. In the meantime, we cannot take peer review as the gold standard of scientific legitimacy. Well, I guess we'll move on. Ah. <laughs> if, if the people who work in the field are not the judge of the value of the science, then I guess, I guess we can just do it by a democratic vote. And we the, vote these gentlemen work in the field. They have yes. a different perspective yes. than the people to whom yes. you're referring. How many yeah. of them? It's a consensus that counts, not the fact that five oh. people oh. raise a view. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's the oh. way it works. <clears throat> uh, if, if, if you want to, if you want to, just let me have my say here for just a second. If you want to vote on what the correct scientific theory is based on your knowledge of the science, fine. Well, your knowledge of the evidence, my knowledge of the evidence. I hope we don't turn science into a purely democratic process, or we're in big trouble. How does that square with what you just said about consensus deciding? Within the scientific community. I said within the scientific community, not consensus in the general public. Let me, let me, let me say two things about I have a the, second uh, question. Um, uh, I don't think we'll try to do the slides. That doesn't seem to be working. Um, the sh question in, in its nub is very short. When and how? When science, science uh, scientists study the history of life, and if you look back, if you think back of those slides that Bruce showed a minute ago, um, they get very specific on when particular transformations took place. In other words, specific dates get assigned to when particular changes take place which contribute to these complex systems. I have one example in mind that isn't quite on the same level as what we're talking about, but uh, if you look at, say, the history of the study of the second human chromosome, chromosome number two. It's been known for a long time that that looks like the fusion of two chromosomes in the lineage that leads to humans and apes because the rest of apes have one extra pair of chromosomes, so apparently there's been a fusion. Now, was it just left at that? No. It was studied to the point where they can spot within the genome where that fusion point took place because there's uh, evidence from the type of uh, nucleotides that show up at the ends of chromosomes as opposed to, uh, to in the middle. In fact, now they've gotten to the point where they can pinpoint pretty accurately when that fusion took place. So there's evidence about how it took place. In other words, the fact that the, the uh, chromosomes fused not in this way but with one of them upside down, they know exactly where it took place and they know when it took place. Now that's the way progress is made within the scientific community. On the other hand, if we talk about design, if we start uh, saying that design is the, the conclusion of looking at the evidence, then here's a simple, simple question. If we're to take intelligent design, design seriously as a viable alternative scientific theory, something different 
is the case than it was 200 years ago when Paley put forth this argument. When Paley put forth his argument for design, there wasn't a scientific theory in place which specified when and how various stages took place in the history of life. Now there is. If intelligent design is supposed to be taken seriously as an alternative scientific hypothesis, then it has to answer two questions in order for scientists to take it seriously. When did these design events take place and how did they take place? Uh, otherwise, to simply say that they're designed is not going to get any scientists' attention. So I would suggest that the reason scientists do not take intelligent design seriously as a scientific hypothesis is because no intelligent design advocates try to answer either of these two questions. They're very specific questions. If you say that a particular uh, function, a particular protein, whatever it is that you're attaching the label design to, then scientists want to know the answers to two questions, when and how. And I think we can pretty safely predict that the failure to answer these two questions will result in a continuing indifference to intelligent design within the scientific community. Um, I, I'd just like to point out that there's a, a kind of form, a commonality in the form of argument, which is that uh, the anti-design advocate sets forward a rule and says, this is how science must proceed. And then having assumed that we all accept the rule, uh, says that therefore intelligent design is not scientific and therefore can be dismissed. Um, it happens that there are other questions in science and Richard Dawkins in asserting that life is the result of a purely undirected process is not saying when or how, he's saying that or rather that not. It is not the result of design. If that is a scientific pro uh, proposition then it is scientific to argue the opposite case and to point to evidence in, in making it. In fact, uh, I have argued that there are loci of design that is, places along the timeline where design is evident. Uh, one of them, I think, is the Cambrian explosion. And I have argued in the very article I mentioned a minute ago that there is persuasive, argument, there's persuasive evidence for an act of intelligent design at that point in the fossil record, in the Cambrian fossil record, because of the massive infusion of information that was required to build those Cambrian animals. I'm also persuaded that there was intelligent design at the point of the origin of life, sometime further back. In, in the timeline. Uh, there are physicists who think that design is evident at a different low site, the very beginning of the universe and the fine-tuning of the laws and constants of physics. So in fact we do say when and moreover we say how. We say it was done by an act of intelligence which is a cause and science is concerned to discern causes. So this is a scientific theory even by Jim's rules but I want to, re I want to point out we, we do not allow the other side to set the rules in this debate. There are important questions that may not be addressed by the rules as they are pr uh, presently constituted. Can I say something about the consensus issue? Uh, it's often said that uh, science is not democratic. It's not decided by democratic vote. Uh, so therefore, the American people don't have a voice in it. And I can understand that argument. Although let's recall that the American people are the citizenry of the most successful scientific country in history. It seems to me that they're not quite as ignorant as the scientific community would make them out to be. Second of all, if we're going to look at the consensus just within the scientific community, how reliable is it? In 1600, the consensus was that the sun goes around the earth. In 1750, the consensus was that things burn by giving off phlogiston. In 1900, the consensus was that Darwin's theory was wrong. Why should we trust the consensus today? And if we're going to go by the consensus, that is by a vote of the scientific community, why don't we teach science in sociology classes instead of science classes? Well. <laughs> Well, every one of those changes you talked about took place not by appealing to the consensus of the population of the world. We'd still no, they were resisted still by appealing to the consensus. Well, we're, not <laughs> we're not appealing to that consensus either. Well, we're not claiming a that. consensus. Well, if you're, if you're saying you don't trust the consensus of the scientific community, well, it was the scientific community that changed its mind about each of those issues. But, yeah. Jim, yeah. <laughs> but Jim, in each of those cases, and in fact, right throughout the history of science, as you well know, Minority positions 
begin as minority positions, sometimes a minority of one, and that person has to persuade his colleagues to change their thinking. That's what we're waiting but, for. But if he were told, don't bother, everyone disagrees with you, the scientific enterprise would grind to a halt. We do not establish truth by counting noses. It is a downstream consequence of our assessment of evidence. It would not matter in the least if 90% of the scientific community thought the moon was made of cheese. It just would not matter. So. Assessing truth by checking to see who is voting for a theory is a very poor way of establishing what's reliable, what's real knowledge. It has to come back to the evidence, and whatever the consequence of that evaluation is, the downstream consequence may be that you have a consensus, but that is not how we assess truth. I still I haven't heard an answer to my question, though, because scientists are not going to take any of this seriously until very specific claims are made about how these design events took place and when. But I, I disagree with you completely. You just did that, didn't you? The fact is, Joe Thornton at the University of Oregon wrote up a press release that accompanied his publication in Science where he said, we now have an answer to irreducible complexity. The time it took to do that experiment was probably two years. That is taking an idea very seriously indeed. And in fact, after I pointed out on the web that he, he said on his own web page, I'm refuting irreducible complexity, he went to his web page and he removed that sentence from his personal web page rather than have this brought to the attention of the public. I'm sorry, there is a different set of rules operating here for your side versus our side, and I think the, it's not a level playing field. Why don't we move on, because Bruce has a second question. Uh, one comment I would make, though, that when changes occur in science, it's because the new theory is more productive. It guides you toward new experiments that you wouldn't do otherwise, and I think ultimately that's how any theory gets tested. Now, uh, one of the assumptions uh, I think that is in the intelligent design movement is that new information or expansion of information base can only occur by some external intervention by, from a designer or a mind or intelligence or something, that there are not natural methods by which information can be created and increased. Uh, there are a number of people working on ways in which this can happen in natural systems. There are a number of g documented genetic mechanisms by which information can increase. Now, uh, Dr. Behe has uh, accepted the idea of common descent and uh, an old Earth three point, life 3.8 billion years, but also has, I believe, accepted that there would not be new information coming in. Un and so if there's not new information coming in from the designer, then I believe you said all the information had to be essentially front-loaded in the first cell with all the genes shut off that would later be turned on. No, no, and I right. want to know, is that what you still believe? <laughs> no, I, I, I never said that in, in that context. I, I was, in my book, I said, you know, one possibility is that the first cell had uh, all the information in it and then was left to unfold. And over that unfolding, pseudogenes might, uh, might, uh, might be produced, other genetic scars and accidents might happen. What I was doing in that particular uh, section of my book, which has, which has been uh, misinterpreted, is simply contrasting uh, the claims that pseudogenes are evidence of Darwinian, that Darwinian processes produced the complexity of life. And I wanted to make the point that they are only evidence of age. They are not evidence that Darwinian mechanisms are correct. So, so, so I, wasn't, when, I wasn't doing that. When true innovations come about, when a uh, blood clotting system ar arises, uh, is that a point at which there is an in, uh, intervention of intelligence in nature? Well, I, I shy away from the word intervention. It, it seems a little bit loaded well, to me. Well, is information somehow coming into nature? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, I'm afraid th these are difficult questions to address, and one doesn't, you know, help things by jumping to premature and unjustified conclusions. Uh, for all I know, you know, the universe might have been set up specifically to unfold, and all the information 
available for the unfolding of life was, you know, occurred at the Big Bang or, or some such thing. Maybe that's true, maybe it's not, but it's, it's theoretically possible uh, as far as I'm concerned. But what if the universe was set up in such a way that the laws of nature would allow information to increase and novelties to arise by natural processes. It could have been, process. but I, I see no evidence that that's the case, and I do see evidence that intelligent activity is needed to make complex machinery. So that's that's why I think uh, intelligent design is, uh, is and, and I, supported. I, I see evidence, moreover, that intelligence is necessary to build digital code, whereas laws of nature produce repetitive patterns that are characterized by what information theorists call redundancy. And uh, repeating the same symbol string over and over and over again is not a, a good way to build the complex irregular sequences that are necessary to build uh, uh, actual proteins. So um, if you have the same uh, s s symbol string repeated over and over again, you get a mantra, not a message. And, uh, <laughs> Laws, by definition, capture repetitive patterns of order, but they do not, um, uh, and therefore, I think, do not explain the origin of the kind of what we call specified complexity information, the digital code in cells. But there are mechanisms by natural law in which uh, you can have gradients of matter and energy being tapped to produce structure and information. Do, do you, uh, you have asked us a couple questions. Do you all have an explanation for the information that's necessary for the origin of life? Uh, I think this is something that is an area of active research among origin of life researchers as to ways in which that information could emerge. There's also people doing mathematical modeling of this. It's an area, that, as Michael said, that, you know, it's too, it's premature. To would, would you point to a model that you think is successful? I mean, is there an expo a, 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 a naturalistic explanation for the origin of information? I think that what we try to do in biology is go as far as we can with what we understand about nature rather than bringing in forces or intelligence outside of nature. Well, I would, I just, I, that's, we would welcome that, first of all. We think the, if, for example, uh, much of the work that's been done on the origin of life, the simulation experiments, the ribozyme engineering, actually ends up inadvertently underscoring our point, which is that you need intelligence to move these uh, chemical processes in a life-friendly direction. There's always this investigator interference. In, in RNA world experiments, they're also termed ribozyme engineering. We think that's highly significant. The engineers are playing the role in getting the se overcoming the sequencing problem. Could I make a, a comment? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, um, but uh, yeah, I, I agree with you, uh, Professor Weber, uh, that science should go as far as it can in trying to explain you know, things like the origin of life and, and so on by, by, you know, without invoking intelligence. But I think it has. And I think it's reached its limit. And I think there's good reason to think that not only the origin of life, but origin of, of these uh, complex elegant systems is not explainable by undirected natural laws. And if, you know, somebody else doesn't think so, I, I, a question I'd like to know is, is when would you think so? <laughs> I think that you're getting out of the realm of science into the realm of philosophy. But you said, you said science, but science should go as far as it can. So the question can, arises, and, and beyond how do we that, know at that? this point in time, we can't. But how do you know when you're there? Through scientific speculation, we can have philosophical speculation. But, but I'd like to point out again, there's more rule setting going on here. Uh, science, essentially, Professor Weber is saying, must limit itself to materialistic explanations, and he's unwilling to stipulate when science would ever abandon that rule. There was another rule that was important in the formulation of, uh, of uh, the historical sciences in the 19th century, which was that we should explain things by reference to known cause and effect processes. And that's the rule that we're following. It's the rule that uh, sometimes is termed uniformitarianism, that our present knowledge of cause and effect should guide our inferences about the, the, the past. What we know from present, our, our uniform and repeated experience in the present is that only intelligence produces digital code. So the presence of digital code in DNA, we think, is a strong indicator of a, of a prior designing intelligence, and we think that's based entirely on a standard canon of scientific method. Uh, Professor Weber is saying, well, we can't consider that possibility because the rules of science don't allow us. At that point, I say what Mike once said in one of his talks, let's, let's break some rules. 
<laughs> the, uh, uh, let's I have see. A, I have a question that directly applies to that, and then I want to bring Craig in, who's been sitting here very patiently. Um, the, you made a reference, it made a bit, might have been a slip of the tongue, but you said something about leaving behind materialistic explanations. And um, there's a phrase that's used among philosophers uh, that is methodological naturalism. That is that the explanations given by scientists are restricted to natural processes, the properties of matter. Uh, and to go outside of that limit is to invoke something uh, non-material. Uh, plumbers rely upon methodological naturalism when they fix your plumbing, for example. They rely upon natural means to try to solve the problem. Now, if we start uh, thinking about abandoning that restriction and letting explanations go outside the natural domain, I wonder how far that's going to go. I wonder if you'd be willing to say that within, say, law or medicine, when decisions are being made about uh, guilt or innocence or about the source of a disease, that in those contexts you'd, you'd want to uh, abandon methodological naturalism as well. I think, I think what Jim is arguing is we don't want science to appeal to magic. And indeed, we don't want science to appeal to magic. But look what's happening right now. We're having a conversation back and forth between Jim Hoffman, philosopher, and Paul Nelson, philosopher. Agents. We are real causes. Here I am talking to you, talking to Jim. He's responding. No natural law, no physical process, no algorithm can possibly explain what we're doing. To explain this event right now, this exchange, you need to refer to a person, a unique agent over there, and one over here, and all of you. That's real. It's not spooky. It's not magic. But it's not reducible to strictly physical laws or processes. The causal category of agency is something that we use all the time in explaining. And in fact, in law and medicine, agency is directly relevant to assessing guilt or innocence there are no appeals to magic, but if someone's convicted of a crime, it's because they did it. Not a physical law, not a regularity of chemistry. So I think the causal category of agency, intelligence, is what we're appealing to. It's not spooky, but it's not strictly material either. Yeah, but the other thing about that is that uh, in these discussions, usually it's not simply agency, it's direct causality. In other words, the agent has to interact with the physical world in some way. And if that's what we're going to give up, well, then you open the way to basically to miracles. How would you categorize the Big Bang uh, when it was first uh, proposed? As I think somebody mentioned, maybe it was me. A lot of a lot of. <laughs> I'm, I'm getting older. Uh, uh, a lot of a lot of scientists really were 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 uh, very upset with it. And as a matter of fact. In the late 19, 1980s, or, uh, there was an, a, a peculiar editorial in the journal Nature by the editor John Maddox entitled Down with the Big Bang, uh, which he said was philosophically unacceptable, quote, unquote, and, and it, because it gave aid and comfort to, quote, creationists, unquote. Um, now, there was something that, uh, you know, what natural cause created the universe? Certainly nobody at the time knew, and people thought it was pointing towards a theological event, and yet, nonetheless, we now accept it as science. Uh, I, I tend to see ID in, in pretty similar terms, that, you know, maybe it does point outside nature, but heck, look at these patterns. It's like the pattern of seeing galaxies rushing away from each other. These patterns are, are things that fit into a category uh, that we, we know about, intelligent agency. Um, so uh, if, if the Big Bang can be considered scientific, why, why not intelligent design? You know, it takes time. And uh, you and I both come from the Catholic tradition, so we have a sense of patience, right? <laughs> <laughs> a couple hundred years goes by, and hey, yeah, we'll get it right. So um, I still stand you know, on my same point, that, that the Big Bang controversy was resolved by scientists who worked in that field, and this one will get resolved also by scientists. May, OK, can I just uh, make a point that you're then not ruling out intelligent design a priori. You're simply saying that uh, you are going to be skeptical until more scientists join yeah, the I think in. I think trying to draw a line between what is scientific and what is not is not very useful. The, the question is, what is 
fruitful for future research. But the kind of points that Bruce was making, you know, there's a research program, where is it going, where is it leading? I think that's a more interesting question than trying to figure out what's scientific and what is not. Let me interject here, sorry. Well, can, we, can we get our last question in with Craig? Because he, he's been sitting here all this time. He just has <laughs> okay. one. I, I don't want to leave Charlotte one. in the, well, in the lurch one either. Question. Guillermo. Or Guillermo, so. <laughs> okay, Craig, sorry. Good evening. Actually, I came with a bundle of questions. Uh, question, questions from, from, from my, uh, I teach uh, the same course that these two gentlemen teach. And I think that's what's interesting here is that uh, all of us probably come together as a community of diversity. And my background is quite diverse. I have a PhD in religion, and I am a clinical scientist, and I work in a hospital. And so I'm going to start off with a non-question, if I could, because I'm not going to get to the bundle probably uh, until you invite me back next time. But uh, my point is, is that um, one comment was made about consensus, and I thought that was very interesting, because um, I would like to just throw this out. Would you universally hold that scientific consensus is minimally important across all scientific lines, disciplines, uh, as well as what we're talking about tonight? Um, you know, when is consensus important? Uh, this is something that uh, I think we need to address, maybe not so much from a scientific perspective, but certainly, uh, how many of you have gone to the doctor in the last three or four years? <laughs> For any reason at all. I mean, I, I work at a hospital, I probably have seen some of you there, so come on, be honest. <laughs> um, certainly when we go to the medical field, what is one of the things we look for? We look for if that medical group that's giving us our medical attention is, is practicing medicine according to the medical consensus of the community. So I think medical consensus is important as well as scientific consensus, and maybe we, we not ought to, to cast it aside so, so quickly and abruptly, because certainly you can say on one poll, if a million people say a stupid thing, it's a stupid thing. But we're not talking about a million people saying stupid things. We're talking about highly educated people who are in this crucible of debate that needs to go on and it needs to continue. So my question is, is you know, do you really think that consensus is not important? And no, when I is it? I would say that a consensus is not important. But, but what we are, what the dynamic of this debate is that there is a very considered evidential argument being posed as a challenge to the consensus view. Okay. And the other side is refusing to engage the argument, but rather appealing to the existence of the consensus. Um, that, that's, not, that's not a way to, the way consensus is, is achieved in science is through a, pro, a, a process of argumentation. Scientists argue about, argue about how to interpret evidence. And we've, we're putting forward evidential arguments. I, I, you know, I, I did uh, my PhD work on the history of the origin of light debate, right up to the present. I know that there is a widespread view in origin of life research that we do not have a materialistic explanation for the origin of the information that you need to build the cell. We could call that a consensus. We're not arguing about the facts here. We're arguing about whether or not an alternative explanation is going to be permitted and whether or not we can have an argument about whether that explanation is, is even is, is better or permissible within science. May so I interject on, consensus that, on is, that point? Yeah. Uh, I, again, I'm, I'm absolutely a layman here, and I've understood a little bit of the debate, but not very much. <laughs> it's been fascinating, though. It's like a slow-motion tennis match. Uh, I have a feeling, and I, I may be wrong in this, that it's not so much a question of whether or not the intelligent debate proposal is getting the respect of the scientific community, but that the intelligent debate proposal is being used politically and religiously in a country which is currently embroiled in political and religious arguments of some considerable bitterness, and that therefore uh, people who may not be fully ready to engage your arguments are influenced by those factors. Normally, if you want to prove, it seems, I think, if you want to prove something, uh, if you want to change what scientists think about a, a certain theory, then you propose something and you work at proving it. And uh, the rest of the community is likely to say, oh, well, you did or you didn't. But, um, but here we have, a whole other layer of complexity which is social and political and religious and scary as hell for a lot of people. Well, that's certainly true. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Dr. Laws. Thank you. I'm going to uh, deviate from the hard sciences a little bit myself because I'm also a lay person and I'm a little bit confused too. But um, centuries ago, religion 
was the authority. And science escaped religion and was able to allow free inquiry. And today, the reverse is true, where science is the authority with prestige and esteem, and that's what it's associated with in our Western society. And many would say that religion in the form of intelligent design is merely trying to skirt itself under the umbrella of science in order to have this seal of authenticity. So I'm curious what you think about that. The second part of my question is, why now as far as, it seems like there's such a push recently for intelligent design to get into the schools. And I have my own theory, which I'd love to hear what your theory is, but also I want to know what you think of mine. Um, recently, science has um, moved into areas that are ethically controversial, such as stem cell research or cloning or trans species, uh, um, trans, you know, trans, in, what is it, engineering, and, um, you know, various kinds of things that, you know, humans and animals together and that kind of thing. And um, so there may be a temptation by some to infuse uh, science with a little bit religion. We also have postmodernism, which has permeated society and the idea of deconstructing, the idea that there are many truths. So it kind of leaves an opening for uh, intelligent design or religion to kind of move into science, into the classroom. And then also we have, uh, recently we have the Korean researcher that admitted to fraud with respect to cloning studies. And we have, I've read many articles about how there are, is error and dupery and that kind of thing with respect to science, even in leading American universities. So it may seem as if science is vulnerable right now. So I'm just wondering if you think that any of those reasons have any bearing, if that might be why there's this big push, or if there's some other reason that I'm not thinking of, or, and also if this authority idea has any bearing with respect to why you know, with religion or intelligent design coming into science. That's a great question, Charles. Are you, are you a, a sociologist of science or religion or which? I, I actually have a PhD in philosophy. In philosophy, okay, okay. <laughs> but it covers everything. That <laughs> um, well, I, I think that, you know, it's, it's tempting to see ID as religion masquerading as science or religion trying to angle in and get scientific prestige. But I think this is really a case of what Mike said, where we just simply don't have categories for this. We have two categories in our cultural understanding of this. We've got science and religion, and we've seen them as being in opposition, dialectical opposition for over a century. Um, there is an area of overlap. The discussion about uh, the origin of life is, I, it's a scientific discussion, but it's incorrigibly philosophical in the sense that it raises big questions. Right. And that's as true of a neo-Darwinian view or a self-organizational view as it is an, of an ID view. So we're in an area of discourse where science and larger worldview or philosophical questions come into, uh, into some, some uh, they intersect with one another. And uh, I, I think what is driving the debate, why we're hearing so much about it now, is the, is the reason that Mike alluded to earlier, is that there's so much new information that has been discovered in science, in biology in particular, but also in physics over the last 30 or 40 years, about the integrated complexity of the cell and the universe, that the, the older view that, says that, the, that said that the appearance of design was illusory, the, the Darwinian view, the Dawkins view, is to many of us no longer credible on scientific grounds. Now having said that, um, we'll, we'll, we'll be the first to acknowledge that this whole debate is loaded with these larger implications, but we want to insist that the debate needs to be adjudicated on the basis of uh, the, the scientific evidence, and we want to allow the, the implications to, to, you know, kind of be a secondary consideration. It's, it's, uh, I think it does disrespect to civil discourse to say, uh, to, to, to cast aspersions on someone's argument because of their alleged motives. It would be perfectly improper for me to say that Richard Dawkins is incorrect about design being merely illusory because he happens to be an atheist and has fessed up to the fact that he likes Darwinism because it makes it possible to be an intellectually fulfilled atheist. That's an interesting fact about Richard, Richard Dawkins himself, but it would be improper for me to make that a, a premise in my argument against him. I have to take his scientific proposal seriously, and if I don't like it, I've got to critique it on scientific grounds. So we, we want to we avoid the motive aspect of this and, and focus on the evidence. Well, I mean, I personally, even though I'm at the critics' table, I actually do believe that um, intelligent design 
can be in the classroom, personally. And the reason is, is because I actually see it more as a philosophy. I don't see it as science, I do see it as philosophy, because I think there's more evidence with respect to Darwinian theory. But um, I think that it's good to incorporate philosophy into science, into the science classroom, because it, you know, it gives a synthesis, a big picture, you know, putting various disciplines together so the students can understand better. But I'm curious, you know, if you want ID in the classroom, where would you draw the line? Because someone could say that there's a slippery slope. What are you going to allow in the classroom if, if you know, other theories, maybe some very outlandish theories, you know, Scientology, for example, when it was first formulated, they wanted to make it a science. And they decided it was not advantageous to do so. So instead, they went as a religion. But one thing they believe is that humans were carried to Earth and blown up in volca volcanoes 76 million years ago. Now, would that be something that, you know, because I'm sure they could come up with some reasons that they think are very good. And I'm just wondering about, you know, and even all of you may have different ideas as to what intelligent design is, which theory would be taught, all of the theories, you know, and then outside of that, what theories would be taught. So I'm just kind of curious about the line you would draw and, you know, its place in the classroom. Um, I, I've got a, a colleague that you may know, John Angus Campbell, a, 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 pr a professor of the rhetoric of science. And he, his proposal is that we should teach the important controversies that arise in science, whether about stem cell research or global warming or certainly this controversy, because uh, for one, it fosters civil discourse and we can learn to, uh, to, to enjoy friendship across divides such as the one we're having here tonight, but also uh, that our, our surest protection against really nutty ideas is argumentation and subjecting ideas to critical scrutiny. So uh, not every idea should be taught for the simple reason that society and, and, and teachers and students aren't interested in every idea. But goodness, this idea has been recently on the, <laughs> the front page of the New York Times and Time Magazine, it's everywhere. If a student brings in Michael B., he's best-selling book and wants to know what the biology teacher thinks of it, do we really have to say that the biology teacher must, you know, muzzle himself or herself? We think that's a bad proposal for civil discourse. If I could add yeah, to John. that, uh, I don't think anyone at this table advocates requiring intelligent design in the science classroom. I know I don't. The Discovery Institute doesn't. Uh, it's premature at, at least. Uh, but uh, we would also advocate, I think, that if the topic comes up, it should be discussed openly, people shouldn't be penalized for discussing it. Now, let me add to that, intelligent design is already mandated in the biology classroom because it's in the textbooks. The textbooks, and I have a dozen of them that do this, including some fairly recent ones like 2005, uh, include sections on intelligent design, but they misrepresent it and they bash it. Now, they've brought it into the classroom, we didn't. Is it going to be discussed fairly on a level playing field, or are the rules different for the visitors? May I give an example of that? Uh, may I have my slide 22, please? Eternal <laughs> 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 optimist. <laughs> While we're waiting for the slide, <laughs> um, I want to elaborate on what Jonathan said. Uh, much of the evolutionary biology literature already concerns itself with intelligent design. Here, this is George Williams, who is a distinguished neo-Darwinian theoretician at the State University of New York. Could you advance it, please, once more? This is a text that one could use constitutionally in any public school classroom in the United States. It's a monograph that he wrote on natural selection. Actually, it would probably be too advanced uh, for a high school class, but certainly a teacher could bring it in. Next slide. Now, here's an argument from that book. Advance it one more, please. This is a vertebrate eye with its distinctive retinal structure here. One more, advance, please. William says, I'll tell you how I know that evolution has occurred. If you look at the vertebrate retina, the photoreceptors, the cells that actually interact with photons in the retina, are oriented away from incoming light. So that as light is passing through the lens to contact the retina, the photoreceptors are facing backwards. So the photon has to pass through a few layers before it actually reaches the business end of the photoreceptor. As a consequence of that, there's a blind spot because the wiring for these cells comes out onto the surface of the retina and to get back to the brain, all these nerves have to collect together here 
And at that spot, there are no photoreceptors, hence you have a blind spot. So William says, why would a wise designer do that? Surely the right thing to do would be to turn the photoreceptors around so that the wiring could come back, go out the back of the eye, and you wouldn't have a blind spot, as is the case in the eyes of cephalopods, like an octopus. Now, imagine that you're a high school biology student, and you read this argument, and you want to evaluate it on its merits in the classroom. Raise the question in class. George Williams says the vertebrate eye is stupidly designed, ergo we evolved. Can we talk about this? Now the teacher, under our current constitutional situation, faces a real dilemma. She can tell the student, no, you have to accept George Williams' authority, or she can say, yes, let's have a debate about the intelligent design of the eye. Intelligent design is already in the biological literature, in this form. And intellectual fairness would say, any student in a public school classroom in the United States, because the arguments are already there in the literature, should have the freedom to evaluate them and not have to accept the authority of George Williams. After all, that's, we wa that's why we have science, because people can get things wrong. Moreover, there are good counter-arguments, uh, evidence-based counter-arguments, the work of George Ayub explaining why the, the eye is optimally designed as a matter of a, uh, uh, as a, a constrained uh, optimization, he says, where the, the, the slight flaw you might find in it because of the blind spot is compensated for by the overall design where by many other parameters are optimized. And, uh, and, and so he says this is an, a, a good example of, of, of constrained optimization, a, a very good design. But even to bring that up, Steve, one would need to say, yes, we can have a debate about intelligent design because it's already there in the scientific literature. Yeah, exactly. I, I wanted to just answer your question, Charlotte, by commending your colleagues from uh, to your left at Cal State. Uh, because I've seen the, the syllabus that Jim Hoffman uses. It's been on the internet in various forms. And I think that's the way to do it. I mean, th these guys are obviously not advocates of ours, but I'm confident that they present our arguments fairly. They assign the appropriate readings. They allow students to evaluate the arguments and ideas for themselves. That may be at this point. That may be at this point most appropriate at the college level, but I think it certainly provides a model for uh, constructive discourse and, uh, and shows how you can discuss a controversial issue in a way, uh, my colleague John Campbell says, we want to harness all these metaphysical tensions in service of, of good pedagogy. You know, that, that students are actually energized and interested by these competing perspectives, and it gives them more of a reason to be, uh, to know their biology. Let me shift here to, or time flies when you're having fun, really. <laughs> Dr. Herber, the, uh, you had your hand up earlier, so definitely. I have a really important item about tiger's eye. <laughs> uh, science does make mistakes, and in fact, the first guy who described that in about 1893 was all wet, and that just came out recently, too. No, that's kind of a halfway joke. <laughs> Just two points. Uh, you mentioned that or you rely on uniformitarianism to some extent because it was practiced in the past, and that certainly is correct, in the 1800s, and it was very useful. Uh, but uniformitarianism in those days is a little different than what we think of today. In those days, not only were they used the uh, phrase, the present is the key to the past, and that's fine, but they also thought that rates were like they are today, and that was a mistake. So I'd just like to bring up the, the second point that the science to this regard is also self-correcting. And a fellow who thought that the, the uh, rates were the same, as well as the processes, uh, took this on, and his name was Lord Kelvin uh, Thompson, the great greatest physicist probably of the 1800s. And so what he did, he started to calculate the age of the Earth. And throughout time, he got somewhere between about 30 million and 400 million years. Well, his 30 million years wasn't enough for the geologists at the time to uh, uh, decide the length of time, either that it takes for evolution or for many of the processes that they saw. But he hung on to that idea till about 1890 when, when uh, Rutherford and some of the folks discovered radioactivity. But he calculated the age, the, uh, age of the Earth based on how long it should cool. Uh, well, it turns out the Earth really isn't cooling that much because of radioactivity. But he didn't know about it. 
So science is very much self-correcting. Then there's another example, kind of goes in the reverse. In the 1920s, a fellow by the name of J. Harlan Bretz, University of Washington, he discovered some phenomenal features extending all the way from Idaho uh, through Washington, through Oregon, along the Columbia River. And he got uh, sand dunes, for example, and ripple marks that were miles long. Nobody's ever seen anything like that up to that time. Of course, now we see them in, in the solar system elsewhere, you know, all the time with about every third photo. Anyhow, he went to a Geological Society of America meeting. He was fairly famous for coming up with that idea. And another fellow by the name of James Galuli, who was one of the gods, small letter, in the US, <laughs> in the US Geological Survey, uh, really took him to task. And he took him to task on the basis of uniformitarianism. He said, this can't be correct because you're talking about catastrophism. And one of the items that was brought up was there's a 30-ton boulder sitting 400 feet above the Columbia River today that was inexplicable at the time. Well, this, this fellow finally came up with the idea of these massive Missoula glacial floods. And they just flooded essentially half states, you know, in a matter of a couple of days. Uh, eventually, James Galuli came around because uh, we soon got air photographs. We could actually see all these things. And so he relented and he agreed that this was a water-borne uh, type process. But again, uh, science was self-correcting, you know, in both those two examples. Those, those but it are, takes time. Those are great examples. The, uh, the, uh, I, the, by referring to uniformitarianism, I'm using the popular name that doesn't, uh, the modern name would be actualism, that's just referring to the idea of Correct. similar causes, not necessarily committing to similar rates. Uh, so that's a good distinction. But our, our concern is about what happens to the self-correcting nature of science if you have a methodological rule that prevents you from considering a hypothesis that might be, might be true? What if it is true that life was designed by an intelligence? Could you, could, and science is saying the opposite, could science ever be corrected when it also holds a rule that says you can't consider the possibility of design? I, I suppose I would disagree that scientists say either of those two on the average. Well, no, not in my experience. Welcome to our world. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this methodological naturalism is wagged at us on a regular basis. And we think if you hold that firmly, you could, if the, let's just say, for the sake of argument, the universe really is designed, uh, would you ever be able to tell as a scientist if you held that rule that you couldn't consider the possibility of design as a, hypo as a hypothesis? Clear you. Clearly, you couldn't, and therefore, science is not in that condition, in that, in that case, self-correcting. It seems to me that one of the concerns you might want to focus on, though, is the fact that uh, design can be used in different ways. And um, this brings to, question, uh, to mind a question that I have is, why does the notion of design, and this is something that Keith brought up earlier in a similar kind of posing, uh, <clears throat> why does the notion of design promoted by the ID movement necessarily exclude the notion of design that many other Christians accept as the result of God's implementation of the evolutionary process, because they would say that there is design, but it's not quite the same kind of way you're talking about design. How do you, how do you discuss that, or how do you address that? Can I, can I jump in? Uh, sure. Um, I would say, you know, that, that's fine. You can have design, you know, God can do whatever he wants. Uh, if he wanted to make life through one way or another way, you know, who am I to tell them differently? Sure. And, and you know, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a Roman Catholic, I went to parochial schools, I learned Darwin's theory in, in, in parochial schools, and we were told that God's... How, how about Catholic theology? I learned that too. <laughs> <laughs> Let me see your hands. Let me see your hands. I just want to make the point that that's what I used to think. I used to yeah. think, yeah, oh, well, God made the laws of the universe, you know, which went on to produce life. Isn't that cool? That's really neat. But that's interesting but, that you would say that Catholic theology has sort of shaped some of your mentality because it's in the loudest voice that I think I've read as a theologian that Catholics speak quite loudly about the fact that they can't embrace intelligent design on a theological basis because it talks about a God from behind or a God of the past instead of one that, that uh, lures creation toward a novel position. Oh, that's and, John Hott you're, you're talking here. Well, sure it is. <laughs> and John Hott is you should, very you should read Cardinal Rassinger's John, op ed piece. I have. In your time. I, I have. Yeah. And, and it, it was also uh, uh, 
you know, commented on by Father Coyne of the Vatican Observatory, uh, that, you know, B-16, as we call them all, all sometimes in Catholic circles, uh, has, uh, you know, a very limited understanding in some of these areas, and he was clarified by what the Vatican really was trying to say through, uh, you know, the, the voice of this scientific arm. And I don't think that there is uh, as much credibility given to intelligent design in Catholic circles as you're implementing because of the way in which they take their pound of flesh and they look at their pound of flesh. You're saying that in, in many ways, uh, the way in which um, you, know, you approach the science is without religion, but I think that it's, it's like the Merchant of Venice. You can't have flesh without blood, and I don't think you can have your science without some kind of preconceived bias. And I think we all walk in with that. That's not bad, it's, it's not good, it just is. And I think that the bias that, that I find happening you know, in the intelligent design community is that it comes from, from uh, anticipating a certain way of looking at the way God is. And it's not, you know, it's almost a proportorship pri of, of understanding that God could only be seen in this. Well, I, I, way. Disagree, I, I disagree. I, I used to think that, you know, as you said, God worked one way, but I looked at the evidence and, and that, that's what changed my mind. But John has something to say here. I, a question to you. Have you read The Origin of Species? Yes. So you know that in it, Darwin frequently argues in the following manner. Uh, such and such must be the case because on a theory of creation, it would not have happened that way. God would not have done it that way. Darwin himself argues often that his theory is right because God wouldn't have done it that way. So if we're talking about bringing in religious preconceptions, they're right there in Darwin. Sure, and there are other preconceptions that Darwin talks about too where uh, according to the uh, American Museum of Natural History, uh, one of the lectures that just <coughs> currently came out of that, uh, uh, that body uh, identified uh, perhaps a different way of looking at Darwin that he would, today would probably be considered a theistic evolutionist and not someone who is necessarily uh, completely opposed to the way in which some theistic evolutionists look at evolution today. And, and it wouldn't have anything to do with necessarily the same voice that, that comes from the intelligent design community. Uh, well, yes. uh, let me ask another, well, maybe it's not a question. Uh, <laughs> should, should the origin of species be allowed in a science class? Because after all, it does discuss what God would or would not I think not that would be done. a very good way of putting students to sleep because if you've read the whole thing, you know how oh, yes. tedious oh, it is. I agree but with I, you But there. I think That's that what, I, what you're getting at <laughs> here is a, is a very, very big difference here that we have to express. And that well, the, di when the you, difference now, is this. When you, when now, you look at it, other let me, sciences... Let me finish my point. What I'm trying to say is that if you're going to be presenting data uh, from a normative perspective instead of a descriptive perspective, well, perhaps some of the things in the origin of species shouldn't be talked about. But if you're going to be doing it strictly to describe what the voice of Darwin said in that book, I think it's fine, and I don't think you'd have anybody clamoring uh, you know, on, on your doorstep saying that you're saying something that's wrong because you're not taking a position, you're just describing what he said. And I think that that would be fine to use what his descriptions might have said if it included something about a deity in a public school because you're not breaking any laws. Well, actually, I have a, a 2005 textbook, a college textbook, uh, widely used by Douglas Fatuma, Evolution is the title, sure. and he has a section in it called Evidence for Evolution, and he uses exactly the same argument. Evolution is true because God wouldn't have done it that way. That's a science textbook. Sure, and I think that if you have a responsible professor or teacher, you would point out that is that truly science? Is it, is it science to be an atheist? Is it science to be a Christian? Well, no, it's not. And I think that when you talk in terms of, of blending those two together and calling one the other, then you have a problem. I so, agree. So if, if I was to uh, comment to a student who said, well, this person is bringing an atheistic perspective and he's linking it to evolution, I would ask him, did he prove that scientifically? Just as I would somebody who has uh, a religious perspective uh, like I believe that the intelligent design community is linked to. I think that you can't jettison your religious perspective if but you I'm really believe it. The point is he's making a religious argument in favor of evolutionary theory, and that there's been a long-standing tradition of doing that from Darwin right to the present. It's part of the structure of the argument for Darwinian evolution. If that's a permissible form of argumentation, then surely challenging those uh, uh, religiously loaded propositions and premises should be fair game. Also, you didn't hear that kind of argument from the intelligent design theorists here. We can argue for intelligent design mm -hmm. 
as a given, I mean not as a given, as a, as a feature of the living world, without appealing to what God would or would not have done. But Darwin consistently does that. May now, I, where is the religion here? May I have my slide 20, please? <laughs> <laughs> I actually think that, that Professor Nelson, great last name, has, uh, has touched on a central issue. When students are asked to evaluate evolutionary theory, the, the arguments and evidence that they're being asked to evaluate historically have been entangled with theology. Here's one example of countless, well not countless, many, many examples in the origin. This is Darwin, very close to the end of the book, making a case for why you should accept his view. And he's appealing to your theological intuitions. He says it makes more sense for a wise creator to have built the world not directly by special creation, but rather by using the laws that he put in place. This is from the origin. Now, I was on a debate on National Public Radio with a philosopher of science who opposes intelligent design, and I asked him directly, would you teach the origin of species in a public high school biology classroom? And he said no. He wouldn't allow it in, precisely because he knew about passages like this where the argument depends on the assumption that Darwin is making about the nature of the creator. If you take the origin, you can do this online, and search for the words creation, creator, created, you'll get dozens of hits because the whole structure of the argument in the origin is to say, God would have done this, yet we observe that. What should one conclude? So I would say that even to teach evolutionary theory properly, you must give students the freedom to evaluate arguments like this, but According to the federal judge in Dover, you're not allowed to do that. I think that's just crazy. Let me wrap. We've, we're, we're running out of time. Let me take one more question from the panel. Dr. Flew, Keith Morrison, anyone? Question? I just wanted to uh, you okay. know, add a point about th this question of religion in the classroom. And uh, to say that I, I think a lot of people share that view, that there is a, a, a kind of a dysfunction about the way we've handled this, uh, uh, this constitutional question of uh, teaching religion in the classroom. Uh, uh, I have a feeling that the, the uh, constitutional, uh, uh, constitution wasn't written the way it was in order to keep out the question of whether or not there's a God or anything else. It was, it was written there to keep out uh, a legal requirement that the country would follow a certain specific religion. The irony of the circumstances we're in now, and I don't, it's neither good nor bad, it's simply an irony, is that, it, it, is that it's one specific religion which is demanding a change to, uh, to the Constitution. The rest of them, by and large, are satisfied with it the way it is. At least that's merely observation on my part. I personally think that it's reprehensible that people in this country are as poorly educated as religion, about religion as they are, and they should be much better educated. And when issues came along like this, they could probably put them into context rather than getting too excited about them. Uh, I, yeah, John, the John out of courtesy to one of our colleagues, would it be all right if we allowed <laughs> Guillermo? <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> So just, we, we've had questions from the other side about what kind of research follows from the intelligent design approach. Guillermo has a wonderful uh, book that he's written, Privileged Planet. He's got uh, ongoing research developing his hypothesis that's being published in technical journals. I wonder if we could just give him a minute to describe what he does. It's, okay. Yeah. <laughs> two, two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, two minutes. Okay, Sorry. thanks, Steve. Yeah. Uh, okay, at least I get to say something. Uh, <laughs> um, well, basically, I, I set out a new hypothesis in the book Privileged Planet with my co-author, Jay Richards, uh, who's a philosopher and a theologian, and uh, it's based on just a, a discovery, uh, something that I just stumbled upon uh, one day uh, after I came back from watching an eclipse in India, and that's the, uh, that the conditions you need for life in the universe overlap or correlate with the conditions uh, that you need for scientific discovery. And so, in other words, if um, you make a, a list of all the factors you need for uh, life uh, on a planet, on a ledger on one side, and on the other side, you make a list of uh, the conditions uh, that are favorable to a wide range of scientific discoveries, you find that there's substantial overlap between the two. So if you have one, you have the other. And that's a surprise, that these two things should correlate. 
uh, in other words, the most habitable planets in the universe also afford its inhabitants the best uh, opportunities for scientific discovery of the universe. And this is true all the way from uh, observing solar eclipses all the way to cosmology and, uh, for example, in cosmology it, it appears that this is the best time in the history of the universe to be a cosmologist. <laughs> <laughs> and that's not me saying that. That was actually in a refereed paper published in Physics Letters B in uh, October 2004, six months after my book was published. Uh, so independently confirming one of uh, my chapters in the book that it's actually the best time in the history of the universe because we can measure, for example, the cosmic microwave background radiation. Some of you may have seen the latest results from WMAP that came back from this uh, NASA satellite that's measuring the relic radiation from the early era of the universe, which uh, is the most important confirmation of the Big Bang theory that Behe brought up earlier. Uh, but it turns out this is the best time to actually measure that radiation, and it's uh, actually the most important thing that cosmologists measure today is the microwave background radiation. So uh, there are a number of research projects that are resulting uh, from my thesis, uh, and there's lots of potential thesis projects uh, in this book uh, for aspiring graduate students, uh, again, in cosmology to quantify just how close are we to the best time in the history of the universe to be a cosmo cosmologist to uh, studying uh, things having to do with habitability. There's a lot of astrobiology that I cover in the book. In fact, uh, my specialty nowadays is astrobiology, so I study extrasolar planets, uh, and I developed a concept called the galactic habitable zone, which uh, is a calculation of the most fav favorable locations in the galaxy to have life. <clears throat> and uh, for example, for those of you who may have been keeping up with extrasolar planets uh, research, there's something most people don't haven't really been talking about in that area. So far, about 170 planets have been found around other stars. That's a remarkable new development in, in astronomy. It's one of the most exciting new, new research areas, a study of planets around other stars. It's amazing we can measure that and, and detect them. But what's being found is that these other planets are very different from those in our solar system. They have very different orbits. They're highly eccentric. And other uh, astronomers, astronomers who are involved in uh, doing these searches, such as uh, Jeff, um, Marcy and Butler at Berkeley, uh, have said uh, that the solar system looks weird, and now that's pretty clear from the evidence. Uh, so <laughs> I said that about five years ago, actually. <laughs> and it's nice that they're finally agreeing with me. Uh, so um, so this, is, this is the kind of research I do, and there's lots of potential for testing a number of the, uh, the evidences that I put forth that's in the true. book. Uh, okay. And so I look forward to other, other research astronomers uh, and astrobiologists to... Yeah. Uh, to take my ideas uh, with them and, and do research projects. And, and so <laughs> certainly it, it, it opens new doors uh, to ask questions like, why is it the best time in the history of the universe to be in a cosmologist? <laughs> That's the kind of question that wouldn't come naturally to somebody who doesn't subscribe to ID, in my opinion. So. Sorry, Guillermo. He's the... Uh, <laughs> I have a panel of critics who are philosophers and biochemists, geologists, and no astrophysicist to go, to go with you there. Sorry. Sorry. This means we have to do this again. We're running out of time. We've run out of time. I've gone into overtime play here. As you can see, this is a huge debate. There's issues in science, astrophysics, philosophy, religion, and so on. And this, this really does need to continue. We need to do this again. Maybe a Cal State Fullerton to pick a neutral place then yeah. for that. So. But, but I thought I'd allow myself as a moderator to be selfish, okay, and ask one question myself of the panelists, and you can all answer this briefly, briefly, okay, which is, what do you think it would take for intelligent design to be widely accepted in scientific circles? Well, I'll begin with a short stab at it. Uh, it's going to ruin my reputation because I'm actually going to agree with Bruce Weber. <laughs> <laughs> Ruin his too. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I didn't think of that. <laughs> what will it do to my reputation? <laughs> you said earlier that uh, what intelligent design needs to do is prove to be fruitful scientifically, and I completely agree. Uh, we're actually working on that. I think we're making good progress on it, and I'm very optimistic about it. Uh, it's premature to mention details, but there are people around the country, actually around the world, uh, actively doing research guided by the intelligent design framework. Uh, so all I can say is... Jonathan, uh, tell about your, your, your paper on cancer research. 
Yes. Really? Yeah. Uh, briefly. <laughs> Brief, no, briefly. Briefly. <laughs> briefly. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> well, one example, I'll see if I can put this in one sentence. I, I developed a hypothesis about something going on in the cell during cell division that if it turns out to be true, it's a testable hypothesis. If it turns out to be true, it could shed light on some early steps in the development of cancer. Uh, I plan to do active experiments on this uh, later this year. Uh, I could be wrong, but uh, I do think uh, if I can't do it, somebody will be able to show that intelligent design leads to fruitful research. And this so, is a direct application of the concept of irreducible complexity and, and design in, a, in, a, it's, it's in making, a guide to discovery. It's making a very risky prediction about something in the cell that hitherto has been uh, poorly understood and poorly studied. And I'm making a very radical proposal about how it functions that can be tested. And if the theory is correct, then we'll learn something. Anyway, the best I can say is uh, I'm optimistic and stay tuned. And <laughs> if we win, we win. Let, let's have lunch in 10 years. And uh, <laughs> if I win, uh, you buy. If you <laughs> <laughs> so other panelists. I agree uh, with Jonathan and also with Bruce that the scientists that I know are intensely pragmatic. What they want to see are results. New discoveries, new knowledge. And I think if, if intelligent design leads to new knowledge, that the scientific community will vote with their feet. Whatever their philosophical or theological reservations, they'll say, you guys made that discovery. We didn't expect that. There's something to what you're doing. So I would agree that that is a necessary task, that intelligent design has to lead to new knowledge. Um, I, in a way, don't agree with that. Um, I, I think design is fruitful, and there are predictions uh, that design makes that a Darwinian model doesn't make. Uh, I mentioned the difference in predictions about the, the age of the type 3 secretory system versus the bacterial flagellum. I can think of other examples, such as the debate about um, junk DNA, whether it's functional or not functional, Des a design perspective and a Darwinian perspective would be very different there. And There's been an article recently about how neo-Darwinism has been very unfruitful uh, uh, heuristically. It led us in a blind alley by causing us to think that these non-coding regions of the genome were junk when uh, uh, we hold that a design perspective would predict the opposite. But uh, uh, the, the theory of intelligent design, like its Darwinian counterpart, is a theory about the history of life and how things arose. And historical theories are tested primarily by their ability to explain already known facts. And I think on that score, intelligent design has already been very successful. Its explanation for the example, the origin of information, or the origin of irreducibly complex systems, I think is clearly superior based on what we know about the cause and effect structure of the world. So uh, that's a successful historical scientific theory. It may lead to further uh, a fruitful research in science. I think it will. But I think it's already attracting a following among the next generation of scientists. And one thing we, we've learned from the great uh, historian of science and, and, and uh, philosopher of science, Thomas Kuhn, is that scientific revolutions are not won in the first blush of conflict, uh, w while all the people who have, are established in their positions suddenly rush to a new idea. But they're usually won after those retirements. And as younger people come along, who are caught up in the excitement about the new idea and what it can explain and what it predicts that other theories don't. And based on our email traffic, there's a lot of interest in people who are postdocs, pre-docs, uh, undergraduates and high school age. And, uh, and I, I think that's where w what it will take for intelligent design to, to win, which is to capture that, that uh, younger generation of scientists. And we're very optimistic on that score. Uh, I, I agree more with Steve than, than these other jokers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's nice to make a prediction or something like that, but reality doesn't necessarily say that it's going to allow you to make a prediction. The question is, you know, uh, does this, uh, does this uh, idea explain what we see? And I think the most important thing to get people in general, and scientists as well, is the future results of especially the biological sciences as a whole. From where I sit, the cell has gotten a whole lot more complex than 10 years ago when, when uh, we, uh, we uh, started ID in earnest. Uh, and, you know, 
now proteins are known not to exist mostly as, as single uh, polypeptides, but in, in complexes of a half dozen or more. Now there are new systems for, for controlling uh, genes that nobody knew of before. And I see no reason that that's going to uh, decrease. The cell's going to get more and more and more and more complex. Here's a, a bold prediction. Darwinism is going to continue to be unable to explain it. Uh, and I think, uh, as Steve says, that as more students, it, it, one important thing that uh, hasn't been mentioned is that now ID is in the public eye. And so students who are coming up will have heard about it. And will, when they go into their classes, their lectures, and their instructors describe for them the enormously complex systems that run the cell, they're going to have in the back of their mind, you know, okay, how do you really explain this through Darwinian processes? And when uh, they don't get a good answer, I, I think more and more will, will, uh, will be persuaded of ID, uh, even if it doesn't make, you know, some stunning uh, discovery. Uh, so I'll give it 10, 20 years. <laughs> Still a prediction. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a prediction. Uh, I have nothing really new to add. Oh, okay. <laughs> to say that uh, there's also astronomy research <laughs> that could uh, help here, and so I encourage all aspiring young astronomy graduate students to uh, consider this seriously. It's the best time, Great. too, right? <laughs> Before it's too late. Right? Yeah, that's right. Well, thank late. you, guys. Too late. And I especially want to thank the critics for coming tonight. Thank you. The, um, I don't know if you saw or read some of the blogs that were going on on the web, how this discussion this evening got some national attention I wasn't quite expecting it to get. But some of these people took some real heat for even coming to Biola, you know. <laughs> so, so I really, really appreciate it. In fact, I'd like to give him a standing ovation for coming <laughs> here. Today, so please, thank you. From my, from my Old Testament background, the Jews will say next year in Jerusalem. Maybe next year at Cal State Fullerton. So, thank you and good night.